Well, this is getting into my uh, PhD work, and uh, what I did was look at um, major revolution in literature that came around about 1150 to about 1200, ma mainly in France, where until that time you had things called uh, Chasson de Geste, which the Songs of the Deeds, which is Beowulf and Song of Roland, where you've got an extremely tough, thuggish men calling insults at each other and then fighting and, and then you know, doing long monologues about their fallen comrades. And the women appeared in about 3% of the pages, according to the analysis I did. Round about 1150, a thing is called Roman Courtois came along, which are the courtly romances, where women were between 60 and 80% of the pages, and ro romance between uh, men and women uh, became a major motivation. They weren't just fighting for their lord um, or their honour, they were fighting for their lady. And uh, this was... It, it was about as popular as the Facebook is today. Uh, people embraced it massively. Um, everybody started to write it once, um, you know, the initial popularity was established. Everybody was certainly reading it. And because they liked what they saw in the literature, and that is the the knights behaving in a civilized fashion, uh, you know, bathing every so often, you know, uh, presumably in like doing radical things like cleaning their fingernails and, 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 and talking in, in a in a reasonably refined and, and, and well-mannered way. Uh, certainly very popular with the women. Certainly the, the idea of women seeking out the men for, the, for themselves, it, it was just seen as such a good idea that people started to act out the, the romances. And a guy called Chrétien de Troyes uh, was... He, he wrote a th uh, the Arthurian romances, a set of several romances set in uh, against the court of King Arthur, and this, I, su I suppose, it was like Neuromancer was in the 1980s to the World Wide Web. It showed a really cool scenario, and it was to some extent a how to do it as well. It, it showed how one should act, react, speak, and they started to to basically set up their own society and and their own interactions with each other to 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 mirror these romances and just like a lot of the kids acted as if they were in the world of near romances so that when the web came along i mean they basically you know it, it had a pre-established culture i suppose you could say of 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 hackers and and, and aficionados so that is, I mean, the original um, courtly romances are, are, I think, the prime example of life liking the literary scenario so much that they wanted to um, th that they wanted it to be there in real life. They they wanted culturally sanctioned adultery. They wanted to be able to, you know, fight in tournaments wearing the colours of their lady or somebody else's lady. <laughs> All of this sort of stuff, um, you, know, you know, it was just too wonderful for words in the same way as a hacking culture, as life on the net, as this idea that you can be a master criminal from your own bedroom as all you need is a modem and a computer. This sort of thing just appealed in the same way as, as William Gibson's Neuromancer scenario appeal to to modern day people and the the, the culture worked its way into society um, it certainly is not the, the, those two are not the only examples of that happening and they certainly won't be the last um, I think there's other literature will come along hopefully I'll write some of it yes. and um, yes it, it, it's quite you know, you know, life following literature, I think, is a very important part of society and, and something that won't go away and which is to be ignored at your own peril. Mm -hmm.
Virtual worlds, from what I've seen of them, I'm not a real aficionado, I'm a storyteller, so I come from a storyteller's point of view. Uh, their, their one massive failing is story. Um, you do need story. And as Alfred Hitchcock said, um, you know, film is basically life speeded up with the boring bits edited out. And a lot of the role-playing games, uh, they do, how shall I say it without being insulting, they do allow one to to be things, to, to have avatars that, you know, stroke one's ego, you know, like you can you can fly in these things, for example, whereas you can't fly in the real world. Uh, you can't levitate from the ground. Um, you can fly in an aeroplane or a helicopter, but it's an awful lot of clutter and trouble and very dangerous. Um, now, it's a fairly good allegory for the whole um, for, for, the, for, the, for the whole scenario of games, of, of, of gaming in general, in that um, you're still sitting there in your chair, you're still alive. At, at the end of it, you can be blown away as many times as you want um, and, and still come back to life, whereas um, in reality, it really hurts. Um, we get gamers coming into the karate club because they want to be the character that they've established in the game, and the first time they get hit in the face, Ow, well, that hurt, my nose is bleeding, um, and this is not what it's like in World of Warcraft. Well, <laughs> yes, I mean, if you're, you're, I mean, the fundamental difference between World of Warcraft and um, facing up an opponent in a karate dojo is that uh, in your chair you're not going to get hurt. On, on screen you may have various things done to you, you might be blown apart or you might have great victories or whatever else but it actually the physical world still has unpleasant things associated with it that give you the incentive to act very differently you can afford to throw away a lot of characters you can afford to take terrible risks in a virtual scenario you can't do that in the physical world or you can do that but it's a very bad idea and you probably won't survive the first time now that is still the difference and it's still the reason why people will, will watch um, who's that um, Welsh guy, um, Bear Grylls who goes into the deserts and volcanoes and steamy jungles and all the various places and does really extreme things because what he's doing is real um, and that's one of the reasons that sort of reality show is very popular um, so will games ever become so popular that they'll take over from reality. Well, no, reality has a lot of a, a, a lot of features that just make it exciting. There is real risk, whereas you'll never have real risk in a game. Harking back to my PhD, it, it, it was a it, it, it was a computer model which looked at the um, types of popularity indices in medieval literature as opposed to 20th century film, and they were practically identical. People found the same sorts of things popular then as they do now, so I'd, I'd say number one, people, even though they had very different values, still liked and were entertained by the same sorts of things. Now, taking it from there, um, and, and in terms of putting scenarios forward, um, Neuromancer, I certainly think, won't go away for quite some time because um, we're, we're, we're still really fitting in to the, to the virtual world. Uh, when somebody writes the ultimate Facebook novel um, and everybody wants to live their life according to that sort of paradigm, um, that's still to come. Social media really caught science fiction, for example, with its pants down. Um, nobody had any idea that this degree of um, of, of socialising online would happen. Um, I wrote a paper back in about 1997 about um, shaping a new type of self for yourself on the internet, um, which was like a factual paper. I'd never actually done it in, in a... in, in 
um, fiction, and neither did anybody else, effectively. But it, it's basically turned out to be, you know, the biggest thing, basically, of this decade, the whole rise of, um, of social media and, um, and, and in general, and Facebook in particular. Now, that's happened independently of literature, and this quite often happens. The, the, the role of the computer in games was totally missed by science fiction and, and, and enter, you know, games and entertainment. So that novel is basically still to be written. Um, other, like some, some novels, even though ter people are terribly um, attracted by that sort of thing, is a little bit harder. Um, you know, like fluffy vampire stories are terribly popular right now. The Vampire Next Door, My Love of the Vampire, you know, The Vampires in the Caravan Park, you know, The Werewolves in the Next Door Alley, all that sort of thing is very big in, 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 in cable TV and, and, and even in free-to-air TV. Um, given the fact that we do and will have increasing um, power over our genome, be able to modify our bodies to be able to grow fangs and, and ingest blood, for example, will people actually want to live that fantasy out in real life. Um, certainly there are paranormal powers that these vampires on screen have that are not going to be feasible in, in real life, but um, vampires are very popular and sexy and the idea of being bitten on the neck seems to be highly erotic, so maybe that will be a, a subculture that people will in fact follow. That's just to use one really way out example, but, you know, weirder things have happened. So acting out fantasies was quite, I won't say big business, but was highly popular. And that's really why I brought the, the, uh, the, the vampire soap opera um, example up, because it, it developed early in the 13th century. A, 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 there was a German knight who was a bit of a weirdo, but um, he actually liked the idea of dressing up, and he dressed up as Venus in, in armour. Um, Ulrich von Lichtenstein, I mean the real one, not the one that um, was played in The Knight's Tale. And he, in the honour of a lady, um, not his own wife mind you, another guy's wife, rode from um, Venice to Vienna dressed as Venus in armour, with a, with a whole train of a couple of hundred people you know, behind him. He was very rich, and, and a weirdo, but he was very rich. <laughs> And he jousted with about 600 knights, from what I gather, and um, gave away several hundred rings when they defeated him and made them bow to the four corners of the compass in honour of his lady when he beat them. And I'm not entirely sure why he did this, <laughs> but, um, you know, he did it basically for the sake of doing something interesting and notable. And later on, I think it was about 1240, he collected some very good jousters, and he was quite a good martial artist himself, uh, a jouster himself, made him dressed as King Arthur and dressed his knights up as the Knights of the Round Table, and they toured Germany, apparently annihilating the opposition in all the, uh, in all, in all the tournaments. And, and the local monarchs and, and, and princes would actually invite him uh, would, would into their castles as King Arthur and I'm not saying he pioneered this completely but this was part of a really strongly growing trend and after a while you'd have real kings and queens in, in, in the Ovingian Empire um, which is Britain and part of France and, and various other uh, medieval kingdoms actually declaring themselves Arthur and Guinevere and, and the knights had come along dressed as you know the Knight of the Lion or Lancelot or the Green Knight or whoever else, and, uh, you know, Sir Gawain and, and, and such, and and, um, and actually act out the parts and, and fight as, as Sir Lancelot. It got a bit beyond that. I mean, some knights dressed up as monks and nuns and the devil and all this sort of thing, and, and they fought with these costumes over their armour. Um, one knight actually turned up as the Knight of the Lion, um, with a real lion, which caused a bit of consternation at the tournament, but nevertheless, 
these are the sort of lengths to which, to which they went. And they made a big party of the whole thing. Um, the women who formerly had no role at all were, were seconded in to, um, to give out the prizes, and sometimes they were the prize themselves. <laughs> so it, well, once again, this sort of thing came out of the literature. And, you know, because there was not entirely sanctioned adultery, but at least it was sort of part of the New Deal, it, it was highly popular. And even though it was condemned by the church and various social reformers, nevertheless, tournaments of this sort were so popular, they continued down until about the 1600s. And in the 20th century, of course, late 20th century and, and now, there's been a big revival in, in, in medieval... Um, I mean, there have been several revivals, but there's a big revival in medieval tournamenteering and medieval partying now, to the extent where there are probably more tournaments being held and currently than there were in the Middle Ages. <laughs> um, once again, an extremely attractive scenario, a bit like the war games, um, a, a bit like the life online back then, because it was it was nicer than real life. And you were allowed to do things, you were capable of doing things as another character that, that you didn't do as the King of Germany, but you could be King Arthur rather than the King of Germany, and that meant you could go out and, and you know, I, don't, I suppose they did see, do see each other's wives anyway, but, uh, you, know, you know, once again, you could step into a different role, which was a more, more attractive role um, than then you and 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 play out that role, you know, which was a you know a very pleasant thing to do in a in a costume party that lasted a couple of weeks, which, which is about how long these tournaments took. The tournaments are very big events, and and they went went on for quite some time. So, did people actually get killed? Oh yes, a lot of people got killed um, by accident or like they turn up with their entourage of of knights and um, bodyguards, and if something went a bit wrong and the bodyguards panicked, they quite often open fire or attack the opposition. Um, sometimes they'd attack the spectators. A lot of people got killed that way. Um, occasionally, you know, they'd, like, they'd try to kidnap each other during the course of the event, that sort of thing. Um, and it depends on what sort of tournament there was as well. The, the original tournament was two large gangs of knights who would basically fight each other around the countryside. Um, as almost like a sort of a martial football game. That eventually, they eventually caught on to the fact that the whole point of it was to actually fight in front of women, and the women were in a stand, so the idea of jousting became a lot more popular because you could do this in front of the stand and look heroic, and, and instead of fighting off in the forest somewhere where your lady couldn't see you. So, um, obviously in these melees there were accidents, and because they were reusing even blunted weapons, um, they were very, very dangerous and a lot of people did die and that's one of the reasons the church was always trying to shut the tournaments down, but people liked tournaments so much, once again, like, rather like the war games and such, that, um, you know, they just couldn't be stamped out and eventually, you know, the idea of unrequited love and all this sort of thing caught on, much to the church's relief. 